Today is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost on the 12th day of August. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 9. Brethren, such is the assurance I have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He also it is who has made us fit ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministration of death, which was engraved in letters upon stones, was inaugurated in such glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it, Shall not the ministration of the Spirit be still more glorious? For if there is glory in the ministration that condemned, much more does the ministration that justifies abound in glory. The Holy Gospel. It's a continuation of St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 23 to 37. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it. And to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer got up to test him, saying, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How dost thou read? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole strength and with thy whole mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered rightly. Do this and thou shalt live. But he, wishing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in with robbers, who, after both stripping him and beating him, went their way, leaving him half dead. But as it happened, a certain priest was going down the same way, and when he saw him, he passed by. And likewise, a Levite also, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came upon him, and seeing him, was moved with compassion. And he went up to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And setting him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarius and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more thou spendest, I, on my way back, will repay thee. Which of these three, in thy opinion, proved himself neighbor to him that fell among the robbers? And he said, He who took pity on him. And Jesus said to him, Go, and do thou also in like manner. And these are the words of today's Holy Gospel. So, a number of announcements this morning. This coming Wednesday, a holy day of obligation, the glorious assumption of Our Lady into heaven. My first Mass will be at 5.30 a.m. at Holy Family, and then the other two Masses will be here, 10 a.m., hopefully a High Mass, and then 6 p.m. On Thursday, the next day, is the Dear Father of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joachim. And then you'll see now that we have Mass next Sunday, but that will be only at 5 a.m. And all of you are invited to come. Now, honestly, if, uh, if it is an inconvenience for you, and it will be, and I already know it is for some, you don't have any obligation to come to this Mass. And then there won't be any Masses from Monday to Friday.
put two quotes at the bottom of the bulletin. I have a whole book of these things that I save up and every once in a while get an opportunity to put them. The first one is, is very important for the summertime, but for the rest of your rest of your year. Once modesty, immodesty is accepted, it hasn't been, it has been, hasn't it? Once immodesty is accepted, once you become comfortable with it, then that's an indication that liberalism has taken over your mind. The other one is by a priest, a French priest, Père Didon. When a man has done all, of his, all in his power to learn his duty, he may still make mistakes. But because he's done everything in his power, he merits the help of God, and God intervenes to save him. It's a very simple way, salvation. It's all in here. You do your part, and God will do the rest. As long as you're honest with him and do the right seeking, he takes care of you. You get what you need from God. That's the virtue of hope. He will always supply the means for your salvation. Those who have the rosary this week, August 12th to the 18th are from Our Lady of the Pillar group. So today is Joe Brenner. Tomorrow is Dr. Beerley. Robert Bell has Tuesday. Um, Mark Licksteiner on Wednesday. Cody Chrysler has Thursday. Joe Bell Jr. on Friday. And Thomas Cheek on Saturday. The last announcement, about four months ago, maybe five, we had a very serious plumbing problem over here in the ladies' restroom. Uh, this building is very old. The pipes are original pipes for the most part, not PVC, they're not large. And so everything was stopped up and it cost an awful lot of money to get it straightened out. What we've done to try to prevent another plumbing, uh, plumbing problem, which was caused by too many paper towels being flushed. I can't imagine people putting paper towels into the toilet, but that's what the plumbers were finding we decided to put in electric hand dryers. A little bit noisy, but they do prevent the paper towels. But they're only gonna prevent the paper towels if you don't bring a roll of paper towels into the bathroom. So those who do this beautiful act of charity of cleaning the bathrooms around here, please, when you do so, get out of the custom that you've had of bringing the towels in. And no paper in there except the other kind of paper that you have to have. And if you can avoid any kind of Kleenexes or anything, please try not to put them down the commodes. And I think that anything that goes for that bathroom also goes for the men's. Be careful on both sides. I think that's all the announcements. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Holy Mother Church has selected for the introit today, verses 2 to 3 of Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is a prayer to be used in time of persecution. Persecution of any kind whether it's feeding the Christians to the lions 
or when you personally are being assaulted, offended, insulted, hated. That can be a persecution. For whatever reason, you're being persecuted. Let's talk about that for a moment. When we are persecuted, the first thing we want to do is to strike back at the one doing the harm to us. But as Catholics, we know down deep that revenge and hatred is not how we are supposed to solve this problem. The pardoning of injuries, the loving of enemies, is the great miracle of Christianity. It's the triumph of Calvary. Most everyone out there, certainly among the Jews and the Muslims, practice an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is not a part of Catholic teaching. This is not Christ. It is love your enemies and forgive those who hurt you. This is the triumph. This is what makes us unique among many other things. But it's a huge difference. On the other hand, even though it's the great miracle of Christianity and the triumph of Calvary, it's also the great scandal of fallen man, including Catholics. Because at times, we're just as bad as the other ones. Puffed up with pride, this person who doesn't want to forgive he doesn't want to hear any mention of forgetting and forgiving. And proof of this are the rivers of blood which, through warfare mostly, have covered this world since the beginning of time. And just as common as war, but not having as much effect on the masses of people, are the hatreds which ruin families and chapels, and which are sometimes passed down from hating parents who pass their hatred on to their children. When a man becomes like this, when he is degraded, revenge is his glory. He loves it. And pardon for him is weakness. But for the Catholic, it's the opposite. Pardoning our enemies is the heroic act of courage, and it shows greatness of soul. While revenge is a weakness, and it's proof of the pathetic little soul. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth to teach us how to behave, and also to raise us up from being guided by our animal passions, gave us himself as our model to imitate regarding forgiveness of injuries. He made the pardon of injuries committed against us the indispensable condition of the pardon of our offenses against him. In other words, as we know from the Our Father, if you want me to forgive you, the Lord says, then you have to forgive others. It's the way it works. It's the way it works with him. He says, if you will not forgive your brethren from your heart, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. You can find that in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6 of St. Matthew's Gospel. Christ our Redeemer dies on the cross forgiving and asking mercy for his executioners. Remember, all that they did to him, to slap him in the face, to spit on him, there was no mercy, no quarter was given. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As God, he could have sent down angels, thunderbolts to strike them all dead. probably what I would have done, and you too. You do that to me, and I'm going to do it to you. Those are our feelings, but this is not what he did. And he likewise adds, I have given you an example so that you may do as I have done. 
ever since the time of this great example given to the world on the hill of sorrow, Calvary, by a God suffering a most unjust and shameful death that he didn't deserve, one look at the crucifix suffices to disarm the anger of a true Christian and to stifle every feeling of resentment in his heart. It's a hard thing to do, and we can't do it without grace. I'm not saying it's easy. Generally speaking, if there were no God and there were no hell, we probably wouldn't forgive anybody who has done bad to us. What would be the purpose in it? But when we look at the crucifix, that is supposed to disarm our anger, to quench the hatred. But if a person, when he looks at the crucifix, and that glance, that meditation, that consideration does nothing beneficial to his soul, then I say he's no longer a Christian. Not in his heart, in name only. And I think that there are plenty of those. From these gospel verses, it's easy to understand in what consists the forgiveness of injuries so strongly demanded by our Lord's example and words. It consists in not retaining in our heart any feelings of hatred, any desire of revenge or bitterness against him who has offended us, but in wishing him good not doing any evil to him in return, and trying to prove our love towards him by our good actions. Some examples of this. To be truly Christian, we have to give the person who offended us outwardly the marks of kindness that are common among friends and relatives, such as answering this person's letters or his questions, selling to him if he desires to buy something that we have, not ignoring him if we meet him in company, and not depriving him of any help or assistance if he needs it. You don't have to like the person, but you do have to love him. And these are signs that you love him. When you do not wish evil on him, and you do help that person out when they need it. And all of this is demanded by Christ under pain of venial or mortal sin, depending upon circumstances of person, time, and place. Another important thing to remember about this is that we are also required to greet our enemies, or at least to return them a hello. If without great inconvenience, we can, by a kind word, cure a person of the hatred that he has towards us, then we are required to greet him first because charity requires us to deliver our neighbor from mortal sin. He's not going to deliver us from mortal sin because he's already a nasty person. But we're not that way. So therefore, we have to take the high road. We are supposed to, and make an act of charity. And even though this might be necessary for the purpose to do ourselves some little violence or inconvenience, we have to do it. Another gospel verse from St. Matthew is, Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that persecute and calumniate you. Why? Why do we have to do that? The reason why is because every man is made in the image of God. Our enemy is made to the image of God. And we are required to honor the image of God. Whether it's in painting, our sculpture, are in a person. Even if that person who bears it is vicious, he's still the image of God. St. Augustine says, man is God's work. Sin is man's work. 
Therefore, St. Augustine says, love what God has made, not what man has done. Furthermore, we ought to love our enemy because God uses him as his instrument. Evil men, possibly many of them unaware of it, are instruments in God's hands. You know that a long time ago, doctors would apply leeches to the sick person to draw out bad blood that they believed uh, was causing the illness. By drawing out the bad blood, they hoped to cure him. Of course, we know better now. But for this analogy, let's go with it. God uses our enemies as leeches to remove our imperfections or at least to give us the opportunity to become better. The evil shapes the good, as hammer shapes the iron. The evil are like the plow that conditions the soil so that good things can grow. The evil are also a service to the growth of the spiritual man. You want to become more like Christ? We're supposed to, to make us become more like Jesus Christ. And so the evil person, used as an instrument by God, helps us to see our faults and gives us opportunities of practicing virtues, especially patience and charity. One of the saints said, our enemies are like bees. They sting, but they produce honey an interesting thought. And finally, remember that no enemy can really injure us who loves God because God makes all hostile plans work good to his own people. In other words, God will always take care of you. If you belong to him, he won't allow any harm to befall you that you can't handle. And St. Paul is the one who teaches us this. Specifically, he says, and we know that to them that love God, all things work together unto good, to such as, according to his purposes, are called to be saints. And that's what we are called to be. Chapter 8 of Romans. This truth then teaches us to bear up against persecutions. He who forgives his enemies will obtain forgiveness of his sins from God. If we forgive others, then we, in a certain sense, have the right to ask pardon for ourselves, as is expressed in the fifth petition of the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So remember, we love our friends for our own sake, but we love our enemies for God's sake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.